أعوذ بالله تعالى من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله جل في علاه وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفيه ومختاره من خلقه وخليله بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الله به الغمة وجاهد في الله حق جهاده حتى أتاه اليقين فاللهم صل وسلم وبارك وزد وأنعم وتحنن وتكرم وترحم على سيدنا ونبينا محمد يقول رب العزة والجلال في قرآنه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون All gratitude belongs to Allah And so we thank him We can never thank him enough And we seek his help Because us on our own we are helpless And we admit that whoever Allah guides None can lead astray and whoever is lost, none can guide but Allah. And I testify that there is none worthy of my worship, my ultimate love and devotion, except Allah. And that Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is his last and his final messenger. Allah reminds us in the Quran, believers, be conscious of Allah as he deserves. That is a big statement, as he deserves. And make sure you stay upon this until your last and your dying breath. As you sit on a Jum'ah morning, listening to the Friday khutbah, the drowsiness of the previous night slowly overtaking your mind. As you sit on a Friday in the masjid, you always feel it's a bit too packed. You feel there's not enough space. You're squeezing in between four people from all sides. You go outside the masjid, you look at the parking, it's the same story. You feel squeezed, you feel tightened, you feel pushed. There's not enough room. And when you look at this, you realize that many times in life, we feel in a very similar situation. We feel that the walls of life are closing in on us. There's not enough time. Rush, rush, rush. Busy, busy, busy. School drop, school pick, work, home clothes, laundry, it's too tight, we're too busy, we're too squashed. And at this moment in time when we feel in this way, what is it that we are meant to do? We are told that our beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he would feel in this way, إِذَا حَزِبَهُ أَمْرٌ فَزِعَ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ He would run, he would take cover, he would find refuge and shade and coolness and calm, where? Not on a beach in the Bahamas, not on a holiday in Turkey. He would find peace, he would find calm, he would find contentment in Salah. And that is the topic of our khutbah today. Five times a day, we raise our hands in front of Allah and we state the words, Allahu Akbar. Allah is the greatest. And at that very moment in time, in the depths of our hearts, we don't believe that to be true. There's a notification vibrating in my pocket, that is greater for me. There is a worry in the back of my mind, that is greater for me. Something or the other is occupying me in salah. And so is Allah really the greatest occupy, is Allah really the greatest worry, the greatest concern, the greatest object of my mind? No, not at this moment. I'm thinking about my car, I'm thinking about my meeting, I'm thinking about the kids, I'm thinking about my mobile phone. My mind is not there. And so is it any surprise that when we look at our salah, we feel ashamed? This salah has become empty movements. It has become aerobics. It has become a nice stretch for the lower back in the middle of the day. But what was this salah meant to be? What is the soul of this prayer that we do five times a day? What is the purpose of this prayer? What is Allah asking of us in this prayer? This is what we need to revisit and this is what we need to ask. The Prophet 
after he receives the first revelation, Allah commands him to read. After he receives the second revelation, Allah commands him to stand up and spread the message of Islam. At this point in time, the work that he's doing is difficult work. It's not easy for you to go to the Kaaba and for people to scream at you and curse at you and throw things at you. It's not an easy job. What is it that kept him going? What is it that was the fuel in his tank? What helped him survive the insults, the curses, the assaults? What gave him the patience? It is the third revelation where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, Ya ayyuhal muzzammil O you, O Muhammad, who is wrapped up in covers. Qumi layla illa qalila Pray at night, except a little. Nisfahu awin qus minhu qalila Pray half of it, or even slightly less. Awzid alayhi wa raddi lil qur'ana tartila Or more than that, more than half. But the main thing is, recite the Qur'an in a beautiful melody. This moment at night, in which everybody was asleep, everybody was away, nobody was bothering him. These private moments with Allah were the moments which gave him the energy, gave him the patience, gave him the fuel to go out there and face the world. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Salah was his shade on a hot day. Salah was his cool drink when it was scorching hot. Salah was his calm in a world of agitation and chaos and busyness. Salah is the thing he would say to Bilal radiallahu anhu, Arihna biha ya Bilal. O oh Bilal, give me peace. Call for prayer. Today we are the opposite. We avoid Salah. We run away from Salah. We actively try to speed up our salah. We don't want to be there. Why? Some of us, it's because we don't know what we are saying in front of Allah. Salah is empty movements and empty words and we don't know what we are saying. If the queen were to summon you today, and I know she has passed you, just imagine. You are summoned at the palace and you are going to be given a very big award and you were told you have two minutes in front of the king or the queen or the prime minister. You would prepare this speech for weeks. You would edit it, fine tune it, read it to your mother, read it to your brother, read it to your cousin, make sure it was perfect. Would you go and speak to the king, to the royalty in a language you don't know? Would you say words to them that you didn't understand? You wouldn't. If you spoke to the royalty, you would speak to them, meaning every word that you say would come from the bottom of your heart. Because you only have one minute. Allah is not to be compared with royalty. Royalty is nothing in front of Allah. Because Allah refers to Himself and He says, Say Allah, He is the King of Kings. He gives kingdom to whom he wishes. And he snatches it away from whom he wishes. The first thing to remember in Salah is who are we standing in front of? When we stand in front of the king or the queen or the prime minister, we are shaking, we are trembling because we know the weight and the gravity of this person. When we stand in court in front of the judge, we are shaking and we are trembling because we know this person with one smack of the gavel can send us to prison for life. What about the one who created us from nothing, shaped us, gives us the oxygen that we breathe and one day we will stand in front of him again and he will ask us about every moment, about every curse word, about every sin, about every delayed salah, and we have a chance now to stand in front of him and apologize before it's too late. We are standing in front of whom? In front of the King of Kings. This is the most important thing to remember. The second is to understand the meanings of what we are saying in Salah. Salah 
The whole point of salah is to remember Allah. Allah said, وَأَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِ Establish the salah in order to remember me. Now there's a very interesting thing that happened in the life of the Prophet We all know that alcohol is not allowed in Islam. But this did not happen in one go. Over the course of 15 years, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala slowly but surely stopped the believers from drinking alcohol. The first instruction, Allah says in the Quran, لا تقربوا الصلاة وأنتم سكارى حتى تعلموا ما تقولون. You can drink, but just don't come to salah while you are intoxicated, while you are drunk. Wait until you know the meanings of what you are saying. Imagine, Allah at this point in time, He allowed the believers to drink alcohol. But he said, when you come for salah, you better know what you are saying. You and me, we come to salah intoxicated. Like a drunk person. We don't know what we are saying in front of Allah. We are in another world and the body is moving on its own. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pro prohibited the Muslims from doing. Before alcohol was haram in all situations, it was only haram in, in salah. Do not come to salah while you are intoxicated. Let us ask ourselves the hard and bitter question. How many of us come to salah lazy, lost, distracted, just like somebody who is intoxicated? And what is the solution to this? To know what we are saying in front of Allah. When we stand in front of Allah and we raise our hands, this is the same sign you make when the police arrests you. They say, hands up, raise your hands. Hands where I can see them. And when you stand like this in front of the police, you have submitted everything. You have no control. They are in control. They can tie your hands. They can put you on top of the car. You have no way to run and you have no way to hide. This is what happens when you raise your hands in front of the police. And when you raise our hands in front of Allah, it is even more than that. It is an act of submission, O oh Allah, I have nothing. I am empty-handed and you are the one who are in complete control. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allah is greater than my worries. Allah is greater than my frustrations. Allah is greater than my boss. He will provide for me even if my boss disappears today. Allah is greater than the economic crisis. Allah is greater than what is distracting me. He is greater than everything. And this is just the entrance into salah. And then we begin to recite Al-Fatiha. And Al-Fatiha, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, it is not just a surah from the Quran, it is a conversation with Allah. When you say Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Allah responds, Hamidani Abdi, my slave has praised me. Imagine, Allah is responding to you. And when you say Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, the most merciful, the most compassionate, Allah responds, Majjadani Abdi, my slave has glorified me. And when you say, Maliki Yawmiddin, owner of the Day of Judgment, Allah responds, Athna Alayya Abdi, my slave has spoken well of me. And when you come to ask Allah, Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqeem, guide us to the straight path, Allah says, Sa'alani Abdi, Wali Abdi ma sa'al, my beloved slave is asking me something and I will give them whatever they want. You are talking to Allah, Allah is responding to you. It is not a one way conversation. This is how you enter into salah and you are standing with humility in front of the King of Kings. We then bow down in front of Allah. And we don't bow down for any other human being. If your boss told you, bow down in front of me, you might give him yani, a few words. We don't bow down in front of any human being. But in front of Allah, this head, the pride of our body, we are willing to put it as low as possible. Because Subhana Rabbi al Azim, how amazing is Allah, the most magnificent, the most majestic, the one beyond our imagination. And when we stand up from this bowing, when we get back up and we straighten our back, just as a break, 
We say, Rabbana wa lakal hamd. All gratitude and praise belongs to Allah. And at this point, one of the Prophet's companions, he was so immersed, he was so excited in salah that he added his own words. He said, Hamdan kathiran tayyiban mubarakan fih. Oh Allah, I give you so much thanks, so much blessed thanks. Mil as samawati wa mil al ard, I will praise you. What is between the heavens and the earth? And whatever you wish after that, the Prophet ﷺ turned around after salah and he said, Who said that? Who added those words in salah? The man said, Me. He said, The angels were fighting to take it up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then, my dear brothers and my dear sisters, this standing in salah is just a break, it's just a pause because you are about to enter into the most important moment in salah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Aqrabu ma yakunu al-abdu ila Allahi wa huwa sajid. You are about to be in the... Your body is about to be in a position where you are the closest to Allah you will ever be in your life when you put your head on the ground. As-sujood. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, on the day of judgment, some of us will regret we will be upset because the time for salah came, the time for sujood came and we decided not now, later. There will be a day in which our eyes will be filled with fear. We are humiliated. Today, you are in front of Allah on the Day of Judgment. And you are unable to prostrate to Him. Because there were times in the world when you were healthy, and you were wealthy, and you were fine, and you refused to do sujood. So today, you will not see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What a punishment. What a horrible situation. In that moment, as your forehead touches the ground, this head that was produced from sand, is now touching this floor which is made of sand. Turabi Turabu sand is going back to sand. We go back to our origins and we humble ourselves, the most humble position in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we say, Subhana Rabbi al A'la. Just as I am the lowest point, Allah is the most high. And at this point, we ask Allah and we beg Allah. And we request Allah because we know nothing comes except from Allah. And nothing is taken from us except Allah took it away. And this is our moment of humility in front of the King of Kings, the giver of all things, the taker of all things, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We beseech him in our sujood. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he knew this was the secret to life. Imagine the night before the battle of Badr. The first ferocious battle that the Muslims have to fight. What would you be doing the night before a war? Sharpening your knives, getting a good night's sleep, filling yourself with meat to make sure you have the energy. What was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam doing? He was in sujood with tears running down his cheeks, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahumma in tuhlikathi al-isabata falan tu'bada fil ard. O oh Allah, if these Muslims die, nobody will worship you on this earth. He knew the secret to victory was not in swords, not in horses, not in camels, not in power, not in ammunition, not in kingdom, not in the army. The secret to winning, to victory, is in the help of Allah. And if we knew that, our sujood would be like his sujood. And our standing would be like his standing. And our salah, would not be like our sada. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum fa yafawza al-mustaghfir. Alhamdulillahi ala in'amih wa shukru lahu li tafadduluhi wa ni'amihi wa amtinanih wa subhanallahi wa alhamdulillahi ta'ziman li sha'nih وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين 
One day, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is in al-Masjid al-Nabawi. And a man prays in front of him and he leaves. And as he walks out the door, the Prophet stops him and he says, go back and pray because you have not prayed. The man goes back and he prays and he's about to leave again. And the Prophet grabs him and he says, no, go back and pray. You have not prayed. And this happens three times until the man comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he says, teach me to pray. This is the only salah that I know. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam shows him to pray. Shows him how to pray. And the only difference between his salah and the salah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is one word. There's only one difference. at Contentment. Moving slowly. Balance. Peace. Focus. at Let me ask the question, the difficult question to you and me today. If the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was in this masjid today and he saw you pray salah, would he let you leave the masjid? Or would he tell you to go back because you haven't really prayed? We have a lot of work to do on our salah. We have a lot of work to do to improve the way we stand in front of Allah. Allah reminds us in the Quran that there will be people in Jahannam, in the hellfire, and when they are asked the question, what is it that made you in the hellfire? As Allah says in the Quran, Ma salakakum fi saqar. They'll be asked, how did you end up in this blazing pit of fire? Qalu lam nakum musallin. They will say, we never used to pray salah. How many relatives do we have that don't pray salah? How many of us don't ever wake up for fajr? How many cousins, friends do we have who don't have the habit of standing in front of Allah? What are you going to do about it? What am I going to do about it? Do we want to see them that day giving that answer in that horrible place? Or do we want to be of those who change this situation? An ummah that loses their salah is an ummah that will go down the drain and lose all of their values one by one. Allah says in the Quran, فخلف من بعدهم خلف أضاع الصلاة. A new generation came that did not care about salah. أضاع الصلاة واتبع الشهوات. فسوف يلقون غيا. They left their salah. They became blind followers of their own desires, and they were lost. Many children has started going to school last week as part of the new academic term. As they go to school and they learn maths and English and sociology and history, parents, don't forget, there's something they have to learn from you and me. No madrasa teacher, no sheikh, no imam can replace this tarbiyah that we have to do. We have to teach them salah. They will pray salah like we pray salah. You've all seen nine-month-old children, one-year-old, two-year-old, doing sujood, standing up, copying their parents. This will continue to happen as they grow. They may be learning from school, but you are the real school. What is it that we are teaching them in our school? Is salah the most important thing in our household? Is salah a beautiful moment to meet our creator? Or is it something we are annoyed about that we want to finish in the quickest moment possible? The Prophet ﷺ said, Before the Day of Judgment, there will come a time in which knowledge will be taken from people. And his companion said, O Prophet of Allah, how can knowledge be taken from people and we read the Quran and our children will read the Quran? He said, I thought you were one of the most intelligent people in Medina. Don't you see the Jews and Christians, they read their books as well. But can you not see that they have lost the true knowledge? What is the true knowledge that he was talking to? Jubair ibn Nufayr radiallahu anhu said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that close to the day of judgment, a time will come when you will enter the masjid and you will see nobody focused in their salah. فَلَا تَرَى فِيهِ خَاشِعًا And if you see that situation, know that the hour is near. 
Could this hadith be referring to us? Could you and me be one of those who stands in front of Allah and every time we stood in front of Allah in our life, it was a quick rush. It was a side thought, an afterthought. A people who have lost their salah have lost themselves. As Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ نَسُوا اللَّهَ فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنفُسَهُمْ Don't be like those who forgot Allah, so he made them forget themselves. As Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu lays dying, bleeding to death, being stabbed in the back by a poisoned knife. Imagine when you are on your deathbed one day, and we will all be, what will you be thinking about? What will you be asking about? Where is my pension? Where are my investments? What are my kids doing? As Umar ibn Khattab lies dying, bleeding to death, he only has one word on his mouth, as-salah, as-salah. He's worried, have the believers prayed salah or have they missed their salah? You and me too one day will lie on our deathbed and the question will remain, will salah be on our mind or will it be the last thought on our mind? May Allah forgive us and make us people of salah. اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا كلها دقها وجلها صغيرها وكبيرها ما علمنا منها وما لم نعلم منها اللهم اعتق رقابنا من النار اللهم اجعلنا من الخاشعين اللهم اجعلنا من المصلين اللهم لا تحجبنا عنك سبحانك إنك أنت أرحم الراحمين وصل اللهم وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أقوموا إلى صلاتكم الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على السلاة حي على الفلاة قد غاب ذي السلاة قد غاب ذي السلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله استوى استوى تيم الصفوف close the gaps الله أكبر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين سبح اسم ربك الأعلى الذي خلق فسوى والذي قدر فهدى والذي أخرج المرعى فجعله غثاء أحوى سنقرئك فلا تنسى إلا ما شاء الله إنه يعلم الجهر وما يخفى ونيسرك لليسرى فذكر إن فعت الذكرى سيذكر من يخشى 
ويتجنبها الأشقى الذي يصل النار الكبرى ثم لا يموت فيها ولا يحيا قد أفلح من تزكى وذكر اسم ربه فصلى بل تؤثرون الحياة الدنيا والآخرة خير وأبقى إن هذا لفي الصحف الأولى صحف إبراهيم وموسى الله سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله الله أكبر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين هل أتاك حديث الغاشية وجوه يومئذ خاشعة عاملة ناصبة تصلى نارا حامية تسقى من عين آنية ليس لهم طعام إلا من ضريع لا يسمن ولا يغني من جوع وجوه يومئذ ناعمة لسعيها راضية في جنة عالية لا تسمع فيها لاغية الله الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله